Welcome back to my channel. I've now seen and reviewed all four of the Welcome to the Blumhouse movies on Amazon Prime. We're supposed to get another four, but it hasn't been clear yet when we're getting those, so today we're going to be ranking the first four movies from worst to best. Before we begin, let me know in the comments your thoughts on these movies, as well as your list if you've seen them by now. As a reminder, this isn't meant to be a definitive ranking, just my personal list, so let me know yours in the comments below so we can discuss. I'll leave a link to my playlist reviewing all four films in the description in case you missed any of them, and make sure to give this a thumbs up if you like these reviews, because it helps me out immensely if you do that. Plus, if you're new here and you like movies, please consider hitting that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with reviews of new releases and some classics. But now, let's jump right into it. In last place is The Lie. I really did not like this movie. At all. There's an interesting concept in there about the lengths parents will go to in order to protect their kids, I'll give it that. However, the execution is a total disaster. Without spoiling anything, you have this horrible event that occurs, and these two parents know that their daughter was involved, and they go out of their way to cover up her involvement as much as they can. The problem is, every decision they make is the worst one imaginable. They know the spotlight is slowly being shined on their daughter, and everything they do makes it all the more clear she's involved, which becomes extremely frustrating, and the only reason they didn't get caught a lot sooner is due to the fact that the movie would be over in like a half hour. Without getting into a rant, it's just astounding how dumb the decisions made here are. On top of that, most of the conversations are just these extremely whiny, repetitive arguments among the entire family. And I get it was trying to show us how this cover-up further drove this family apart, but it's so melodramatic and so repetitive that it just gets tiring after a while, and it sucks all the joy out of watching this, if there even was any there to begin with. Plus, the acting is atrocious from nearly the entire cast. I'm not not saying these actors are bad in general, and this is partially due to the direction they're given, but they're really unbearable here. I try not to go too hard on actors, but I'm sorry, they were just a total mess, and it made this an absolute chore to get through. In third place is Nocturne, and there's an interesting premise here. It felt like this mix of Suspiria and Black Swan, except that they were catered to this young adult crowd, and unlike The Lie, the performances are good here, in particular from Sydney Sweeney and Madison Iceman. I like the slow-burning tension that was built up between them. The problem is, this never fully delivers on its premise. There are supernatural elements to this story, Story, as it involves a book with these cryptic drawings, and we'll see these weird images and bright flashing lights, but we don't really understand how any of this works, and it's not like the movie just leaves things open-ended, it just never gave us enough to begin with. I would have liked if they explored these supernatural elements so much more, and I also would have liked if Sydney Sweeney was given a little more to do. Her character is extremely reserved, and I get she lives her life in everyone else's shadows, but that's about the most we have to work with. So I think if it moved parts of the second half up to the first half, and then used that time to dive into the supernatural elements more, I think this would have been a much better film. But unfortunately, its pacing is a bit sluggish, and ultimately, I didn't care for this one either. Coming in at number two is Evil Eye. Once again, another movie that suffers from some sluggish pacing. We get a lot of repetitive scenes between our two main characters, but it gave us a little more to work with than Nocturne, so despite the issues, I had a slightly better time with this. It's definitely not great, but better. I definitely like the concept of this killer potentially being reincarnated into this one character's boyfriend. I also liked how these horror elements are used to explore a broken family dynamic, which is similar to the other movies here. And despite the repetition, like we get a lot of concerned phone calls between our two main characters over and over again, there were still some effective scenes. I didn't think the boyfriend, played by Omar Biscotti, who's supposedly the reincarnation of this killer, I didn't think he was all that intimidating, and I'm not sure if he was just miscast or if that's how he was supposed to be, but Sarita Chowdhury and Sunita Mani, who play our two main characters, this mother and daughter, were both great. They carry this. I felt they worked off each other well, and because of some solid writing, I was invested in what happens to them. And even though it's a bumpy ride and I wouldn't exactly revisit this anytime soon, I cared enough to want to see how this plays out. In first place is Black Box. This this is the only one I'd call a truly enjoyable watch. It's extremely well acted. I thought both Mamudo Atie and Felicia Rashad crushed it here, as did Amanda Christine, who plays Atie's daughter. It's got some really solid direction. It felt extremely claustrophobic. It played up the creepiness very well. And these are all just really well-written characters. And again, I cared about what happened to them. There's a great sense of suspense and mystery. And like the other movies, there's a heavy family drama aspect to it as well. Though because it's focusing on a character who's suffering from memory loss, it gave us an in-depth look at his mental state. And I enjoy when movies do this, because then we get complex, nuanced characters who we're truly invested in. That being said, while I did like this, I still wouldn't call this great. Mainly because there's a twist. And while the idea itself isn't so bad, some of the choices the characters make and the logic behind them can be too much of a suspension of disbelief. And there were a few times where I was like, okay, I fully can't buy into this. I didn't exactly hate it, but it causes such a drastic tonal shift that it comes across as a bit jarring. And I can see some people potentially having a problem with it. For me, the performances 
are still very good in this part of the movie and because I still cared about these characters I was still interested in seeing how things played out. So while it's an uneven experience the good outweighs the bad enough here that I can still give it a full recommendation. And that's my ranking of the first four Welcome to the Blumhouse movies and it's kind of disappointing. While I found one to be good and another to be decent, none of them really wowed me. I mean, truthfully, my expectations weren't that high to begin with, but I was hoping for a little better, especially because Blumhouse is capable of better. Hopefully the next four movies will be an improvement, but I'm not exactly holding my breath. So let me know, have you seen any of these movies? And if so, what's your favorite and what's your least favorite? Did you like any of them at all? And what's your favorite Blumhouse movie in general? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. And for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll catch you next time.